Let's go. What's up? <laughs> Excited to be together. I get to talk about something I love to talk about. And that's why the Bible is true and reasonable. Amen. So we're going to see some facts today. Picture. There's a lot of slides. Now, if you want to get, you know, see it again, it will be online next Sunday. It'll be up there forever, so you can check it out. Unfortunately, today, that monitor just went off this morning, so you're going to have to look over here. So if you want to move over here to see it, you could do that, or you could just watch online. But this is where all the slides will be today, and we got a bunch of them. So we're going to look at some cool stuff. The first fact I'm going to drop on you right now will blow your mind. St. Patrick is Italian. No, true story. He was a Roman. He was captured. He was kidnapped from Rome, taken to Ireland. He escaped, and then later in life, he went back to start churches there. But he's actually St. Patricio. Let's go. That's actually true, so you could, you could fact check me on that if you want to. I'm sure a lot of you guys will fact check a lot of what I say today, so it's all good. So, you know, you can wear green. That's all good, but you could put a little red and white in, too, if you want to, you know. So anyways, let's get right to it. I want to start Acts chapter 26, which is basically the history of the first church. The book of Acts was written by Luke, who also wrote the Gospel of Luke. But what we're going to focus in on here is someone in the Bible called Paul, the Apostle Paul. He wrote most of the New Testament letters that we would read. He was one of the greatest church builders of all time. But that's not how he began. He actually began as Saul of Tarsus. He was a Pharisee, the group of men, the religious leaders who actually put Jesus to death. And there's a good chance he was on that group of people who sentenced Jesus to death. And he devoted himself to trying to destroy the Christian church. He was throwing them in prison, having them killed, because he thought he was trying, he was wiping out this new cult that had started. So that's how he got his start. But then he was met on the road to Damascus by Jesus in a vision. And he was brought to faith by that. It changed his life so much so that the guy who was killing Christians was now the greatest church builder of all time. And so he's such a witness in and of himself. But in this situation we're going to see here, it's a time in his life when he's arrested. He's before the Roman governors. And the Jews had sent them to the Romans to say he, he's preaching stuff against Rome and he needs to be killed. So the Jewish religious leaders want him killed. The Roman governors are like, we don't know about all this Jewish stuff. Well, what are we supposed to do with him? He didn't do anything against Rome, so we can let him go. But he's like, no, I appeal to Caesar. So now he wants to go to Rome and appear in front of Caesar because he wants to preach the word there. So what they, happens is, of course, the Roman governors, Festus and Felix, they don't know anything about the Jewish law, so they bring in King Agrippa, the king of the Jews. He knows all of the Old Testament, the prophecies. He grew up with it all. And so they bring him in, and they're like, look, we don't know what this guy's raving about, but you'll know this, so how about if he can speak before you? So Paul here is basically on trial, and he's about to stand before King Agrippa of the Jews and share with him why he has preached that Jesus died, was resurrected. And, and so here's where we pick that up right here. And it's so cool to see how he shares his faith with King Agrippa. Acts chapter 26, verse 19. So then, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven, first to those in Damascus, then to those in Jerusalem and in all Judea and to the Gentiles. I preached that they should repent and turn to God and demonstrate their repentance by their deeds. That is why some Jews seized me in the temple courts and tried to kill me. But God has helped me to this very day. So I stand here and testify to small and great alike. I am saying nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses said would happen. That the Messiah would suffer and, as the first one to rise from the dead, would bring the message of light to his own people and to the Gentiles. At this point, Festus, this was the Roman governor, Fest, or Festus, yeah, interrupted Paul's defense. You are out of your mind, Paul, he shouted. Your great learning is driving, your ins driving you insane. You see, Paul was a very learned man. He was trained under Gamaliel, one of the top Pharisees. He was super educated. He was a Jew that had Roman citizenship that was very rare. He was highly respected. And so, so the Roman governor's like, all your great learning has made you crazy, right? And what Paul says here, verse 25, I am not insane, most excellent Festus, Paul replied. What I am saying is true and reasonable. The king is familiar with these things. 
and I can speak freely to him. I am convinced that none of this has escaped his notice because it was not done in a corner. You see, they were out there preaching. Jesus was out in the open. He was killed on the cross in front of thousands of people. It was not done in a corner. It was done where everybody can hear about it and see. That was the whole point. And so he's appealing to Agrippa because Agrippa, again, knows the Jewish scriptures and everything, right? So he goes on and says, King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. Then Agrippa said to Paul, do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? Paul replied, short time or long, I pray to God that not only you but all who are listening to me today may become what I am except for these chains. Yes! Our man Paul preaching the word. And man, that's, you know, I want to say the same thing. When I, when I share the Bible, I, I hope everybody becomes a Christian. Obviously. I, I want that for everybody. But you know, I run across a lot of people from different backgrounds. Some hate God. Some are atheists. Everybody's got different views of God. And, you know, they all want to argue. And, you know, that's fine. And atheists will come at me hard. And I, why would you do this? You're foolish. You're just speaking to the air. There's no God. All this. So what I always, I always tell guys, I've said this for years. I'm like, okay, well, here's the deal. So if at the end of all things, this is all false. Hey, I'm still good. I had a great life here. I have a church family. I stayed away from sin. So my marriage could be good and my kids could, could love me and I could have a better life. I didn't do stuff to destroy myself. So I'm good. Amen. Right? But if it's true, you got some problems waiting for you. So I'm going to be a Christian. But I didn't do it blindly. See, for me, I, I, I look at Paul and I'm like, I could really understand him, where he came from. Because for myself, I was a science guy. I, I was a doubter. I didn't, I didn't need a crutch. I was very popular. I had a lot of money. I had everything you could want. So I wasn't looking for a crutch like people say. No, uh, I had a lot of questions, but somebody invited us out to church. And you know, I think all of us deep down inside think about why are we here? There's something in us that, that money and prestige is not going to fulfill. And that's put in there by God. And so when Tracy and I got together and we both had, we were just, we didn't know where to go because unfortunately there's a lot of hypocritical Christianity, a lot of bad things done in the name of God. But you know what? That's not God and that's not Jesus. It's people who are not doing it the proper way. So we got invited to this church and the thing I loved about the church is they were, they were very Bible-based, right? And so, you know, for Tracy and I, we're like, hey, we, we, we should at least check it out, right? But here's the thing, here's the problem when you first start out, is that there are liars on both sides of the fence. They're, they're atheists and Christians, Christians alike that throw out crazy stuff. Like I remember early on, I was talking to this dude, Christian dude, right? And I'm like, what about the dinosaurs? And you know what he told me? It's crazy. He goes, oh, they never existed. God just put those things in the ground to test our faith. He put the bones in the ground to test our faith. They never existed. I'm like, so God is a liar in order to help us come to faith to be loving and honest? What sense does that make? You know, many, many people say the earth is only, you know, Christians will say the earth is 2,000 years old. Guys, come on. Look, look at the science. It's not 2,000 years old. It's billions of years old. And, you know, so on both sides, I was like, what can I trust? So we, we studied. We just went at it ourselves. We looked up. You know, we didn't even have online. We had to go to the library and check stuff out. Yeah, right. This is when you had to work for stuff, not, do, do, do. oh, there it is, you know. So it's like, it was crazy. But so we had to dig in for ourselves and put aside, because on both sides of the fence, like I said, the Christians were saying that. And then, you know, there was actually a, a, a professor from a well-known college that said, oh, we found this book, it's this new archaeological find, and it proves that you, you know, it was okay to live alternative lifestyles until it was proven that it was a forgery that he had made just to prove his alternative lifestyle would be okay biblically. So listen, there, there's, there's junk on both sides. 
you got to really dig in, guys. you you got to say, let me take people out of it and just go to God. Let's just go to the facts. And so today, I hope I could just stimulate you to want to dig in a little more. Because listen, I want everybody to get to understanding the love of God and purpose and all that great stuff. But there's a lot of us, we can't get past the fact of, is this thing real or not? I can't even get to the other stuff until I actually believe the Bible's true. So, I hope today it will help you. There was a couple things I, I did when I was a young Christian. I heard about this guy named John Clayton. He has a whole thing called Does God Exist? And I loved it because he was a science teacher who decided to set out to, to scientifically disprove the Bible, but then became a Christian because of it. And there's another one you could find. This guy is awesome. He does a thing called Cold Case Christianity. His name is Jay Warner Wallace. He's been on television, a famous Los Angeles detective. And um, his wife was a Christian, and she kept trying to get him to come to church, and he goes, all right, you know what, finally, this is why he was an atheist. He goes, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to treat it like a cold case. I'm going to treat it with all the same ways that I figure out crimes. I'm going to figure out if Jesus really raised from the dead. I'm going to figure out if it really happened. So he went in again to disprove, and now is a Christian, and devotes his time to scientifically helping people believe in God. You can look both of those things up. Like I said, everything will be online next week. So let's talk about the Bible. Let's get into it, right? I, I get fired up about this stuff. So the Bible, the word Bible means book, by the way. But in the Bible, there's 66 books, 39 Old Testament books. Now, Old Testament is the time before Jesus, all the way from creation to Jesus. And the New Testament has 27 books, and that's all about Jesus, his life, and then the early church. And so that's the New Testament. So there's 66 books. They were written over a 1,600-year span. Long time, right? Over 40 generations. There are over 40 different authors of the books of the Bible from all walks of life and all kinds of places. It was written on three different continents, in three different languages, and hundreds of controversial topics are covered in the Bible. Yet, there are complete, there's complete harmony between all those parts. That's the first thing that blew my mind. And these, most of these scriptures were written during the lifetime of those who were alive at that time that could easily have reported the happenings. The validity, validity could have been denied and refuted. I mean, look how it is today. Someone comes out with something fake. You can just tear it down, right? Because you're here and you can say it didn't happen. But the Bible is so incredible. It has survived numerous persecutions and outlawings. And I shared last week even about um, Voltaire, who was basically a French Enlightenment writer, historic, historian, philosopher. He lived in the early 1700s. And what he said about the Bible is he said, in another century, the Bible will disappear from earth. It's very anti-Bible, right? 50 years after his death, the Geneva Bible Society was using his home to produce Bibles. Napoleon said the Bible is no mere book, but a living creature with a power that conquers all who oppose it. The Bible is an incredible book. It's powerful. It has lasted for thousands of years, and it still is valid and powerful today if we just look at the facts. If you like this video, you can click right here and you can watch the full version of this sermon. You can subscribe to our channel and watch every Sunday with us at 1130 a.m. We hope you have a great day and as always, go Bills.